I was ready. Do the best you can. <laughs> That's two minutes.
Well, amen. Thank you, Steve and Penny. And I want to welcome you to our service tonight. We're glad you're here. And I'm not going to sing, all right? We're glad you're here tonight. And uh, if you haven't been to our revival yet, we would especially welcome you. And thank you all for being back tonight. And we had a great day yesterday. I enjoyed the day very much. And uh, didn't the Lord bless us with a beautiful day today? And uh, we're just glad to be here. It's good to have Steve back and Brother Sammy back. And uh, each night this week, we'll be taking a love offering for these guys. And uh, the way for you to do that, there are some envelopes in the pew. If you want to give to the love offering, just pull one of those out, put your check or your money in there. After the service, just drop it in either one of these boxes, and it'll go, everything will go towards the love offering. And uh, are you glad to be here tonight? I am, and it's just been a glorious day. Let's stand, if you will. We're going to sing, but uh, greet those who are around you first, and then we'll go right on with the service.
so much for your love for us, for the blood of Jesus that was shed for our sins. Father, that amazing grace that we sang about tonight, Lord, we just can't praise you enough for it. And Lord, right now, as we enter this time to hear your word, I pray for my brother Sammy. God, I pray you just fill him again with your power, your anointing. God, we feel that you've been moving in this place, and I pray we continue tonight as you speak to hearts, that there's someone here who don't know that perfect peace. They've never accepted the fact that you paid it all for them. I pray that this would be that night. Lord, speak to their heart. Move them to come to you tonight. We ask it in Jesus' mighty, precious name. Amen. Hello. I'm Sammy Gilbreth, Director of Evangelism for the Alabama Baptist Day Convention. I'm always amazed how life can just be rolling right along and all of a sudden out of the blue, from nowhere, an event, a set of circumstances can take place to change your life forever. It affects and changes the lives of the friends and family members who love you. Right here in this room, right here in this hospital, that happened to me. I was diagnosed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a large blood clot and an aneurysm in the left ventricle. And the words came, you're going to die, and you're going to die very quickly. When you get those kind of unexpected words, you glance around that room and see the horror on the face of your wife, the fear on the face of your children. You can almost read their thoughts, what's going to happen to us. What's going to happen to our home? Are we going to have to drop out of college? Where do we go from here? The cardiologist said, Mr. Gilbreth, I don't know but of one person in the world who would even be willing to treat you or talk with you, but I'm willing to call him. He said, there's a Dr. Marin in Minneapolis, Minnesota that is specializing in the disease you've just been diagnosed with. He picked up the phone in our presence and called Dr. Merritt and over the speakerphone after he explained the patient that he would like to send to him. I heard Dr. Merritt say, how quickly can you get him here? He's the only one alive today. There have only been 12 cases in the world diagnosed with this. Only four of those 12 survived with a blood clot. I'm still carrying the largest blood clot in medical history sitting at the base of my left ventricle. Of those four, no one survived with a blood clot and an aneurysm. When my heart massages, it blows a bubble on the outside of the heart. It's just a matter of time until that gives way. They rushed us to Abbott Hospital in Minneapolis. We sat down with their team. They brought all their specialists in, everyone they could have, and we sat around a conference table Dr. Marin said, Mr. Gilbert, you realize everything that we do with you will be experimental because no one's lived this long. But we're willing to try what we think will work if you're willing to try it. I said, sure. He said, what do we like to do? We'd like to cut an artery here in your neck. He said, but 
chances are when we do that, it'll cause your lungs to collapse, start a domino effect, and your body will shut down, and you'll probably die on the table. He said, but if we can get by that, I'd like to run a lead down in your heart. I need to monitor it and see what's going on. He said, but Mr. Gilbreth, if I get within a hair's thickness, too close to the blood clot, and it moves, it'll kill you instantly. He said, but if I can get by that, I'd love to screw that lead in the side of your heart so I can monitor the aneurysm. He said, Mr. Gilbert, if I rupture the aneurysm, you'll bleed out before I can open your chest. And he paused. I assumed he wanted an answer. I looked at him and I said, Dr. Merritt, I, I don't know what to say. Why don't you come sit in my chair, put your family in front of you like I have in front of me, hear the news you've just given me. What would you do? He said, oh, I'd have the surgery. You're going to die anyway. You might as well die trying something. That'll make your day right there. That'll... That'll just charge you up. But I did make it. After the surgery, he said, Mr. Gilbreth, go home and get everything in order. He said, we've bought you a little time, maybe six months. But it'll be a long six months. So whatever you have to do, do it quickly. I sat down with our family and we started going through scripture. God gave me a passage, and if you have your Bible with you, I want to share with you the scripture that our family hangs on and looks at often. It's in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul says to the young preacher Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. I'm convinced tonight that if you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you have to learn the value of the promise of life. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a world today that has no value on life. We don't even blink at taking a life of an unborn child. We don't even blink at drive-by shootings anymore that will kill young kids standing out on the street. So the message tonight really is twofold. For some of you, I hope it'll be an encouragement to end well. For some of you, you still have time to make some major adjustments in your life so that ending well will be surely in your grasp. But we're going to have to have a value of life. I, I spend way too much time in hospitals, but I love to go to maternity wards. I love to go on this wall and look at that wall, and on this wall there are windows. And over on that side of the windows are all those bassinets and all those babies. I love to stand on this wall and watch folks go to that wall and make idiots out of themselves. Come on, you've seen them. They shove their face up on that wall. They tap on the window. That's mine right there. Isn't that the cutest thing you've ever seen? And I want to say, no, it's red and wrinkled. It doesn't look done. <laughs> can you imagine those babies? I can imagine turning one. I got to go home with that. <laughs> we get excited about birth. But it's almost like we've put out of our mind death. I get asked often, Brother Sammy, you think God's going to heal you? Not at all. I do believe he's chosen to sustain me. You see, I'm convinced if he heals me, the doctors will take credit for it. If he sustains me, it would be sung and went to the Baptist building and signed all the paperwork so that anything that we could do ahead of time would be that much less pressure on Carol when this thing happened. We discussed everything we could possibly discuss to minimize the pressure on my two kids and my wife. I'd be lying to you tonight if I told you that's an easy conversation. It's not an easy. It's not easy to sit there and convince them this is reality. This is going to happen. We finished that conversation and Carol and Bryn, my daughter, had a wedding to attend the next day and they went upstairs. I shared with you the other night, my son's the athlete in the family. He went out in the den, and I stayed there in the kitchen, sort of trying to get my composure. 
walked down the hall after a little while and walked in the den to sit down with Barrett, and I was not prepared for what I found. That big hulk of an athlete was slumped over in my recliner, crying his eyes out. I pulled a chair up by him, and I said, Baird, I, we can get through this, but you're going to have to talk with me. You're going to have to tell me what you want the family to do and what you don't want the family to do. And I give you my word, we won't make any decisions without the entire family be involved in this. He said, Dad, you didn't know this was coming, and I didn't know this was coming, and I'd planned a surprise for you and Mom tonight. I said, Son, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, Dad, I'd planned to give my girlfriend an engagement ring tonight. We were going to come by and surprise you and Mom. He said, Dad, please don't tell me you're not going to be here to marry us. He said, Dad, someday when we decide to start a family, please don't, don't say you're not going to be here to be my kid's granddad. I said, Barrett, I can't promise you something that I have no control over. They decided instead of a long engagement that they would have a very brief engagement to take care of what little time I had left. And so they moved the wedding up to just days instead of many, many months. Went back by my cardiologist for a checkup and he went through all the tests and said, Mr. Gibber, what are you going to do today? I said, well, when I leave your office today, I'm driving to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm going to marry my son and his new fiance. They've changed the wedding date to accommodate my health and I'm going to drive to Baton Rouge and perform that wedding. He said, you won't make that. He said, there's not a chance in the world that you can make that trip. I said, I understand. We contacted our home pastor and said, look, my cardiologist said, there's no way I'll make it. I want you to be there and perform this service. See, you can't stop living over something you have no control over. But I did make the trip. I pronounced Barrett and Ashley husband and wife, and I was watching them and that huge wedding party march out, and I walked over Brother Michael on this side of the stage, and I just watched them, and, and I thought, Lord, I, I'm okay with this. But Lord, I still have a son and a daughter and a wife, and now I have a daughter-in-law. And so, Lord, I, I'm going to ask you, would you just give them some special grace? Brother Mike, the sweetest answer of prayer that I've ever received in all my life came on that stage. As my Lord whispered sweetly in my ear, grace is never given in advance. Grace is always given at the point of need. And when they need it, there will be more than enough. That's why I can still crawl in a car or an airplane and travel all over the world still preaching the gospel because I know when this happens, my Lord has promised there will be grace available. So if you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of spiritual blessings, grace, being far more important than physical things. Look in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience. Let's stop right there. I was working through these verses and I came to that clear conscience. You do understand that a clear conscience doesn't come with a four-leaf clover or a New Year's resolution. A clear conscience only comes with the blood of Calvary, with a personal confession in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He and only He can grant a pure conscience. I began to pray about that, knowing that any day I could slip out into eternity And as I was praying, God shared with me, if you add the word if to an apology, it negates the apology. If I say to Brother Mike, if I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry. That is not an apology. The minute I added the word if, what I really said, you got a problem, you need to get over it. And I realized I'd done that all my life. I'd said to my kids, if I disappointed you, I'm sorry. I'd said to my wife, if I let you down, I'm sorry. And I realized I was carrying unconfessed sin and apologies that had never been completed. 
I sat down and I started making a list of people that I felt like I needed to go to and make it right. Fairly long list. I found most of them fairly quickly. I went back, of course, to my wife and my kids and then started working on the list. It came down to the last three and I, I couldn't find them. I was preaching at First Baptist Church, Jackson, Mississippi. I checked in the motel that night, was preaching there the next morning. After I got in my room, my cell phone rang. And I picked it up, and the voice said, Sammy, are you preaching at First Baptist Jackson in the morning? I said, yes, I am. Who is this? He said, this is Nelson Crozier. He was the next to the last one on the list. I'd look for him everywhere. And I preached the next morning. I ended, and Nelson was coming down the aisle, and I went and met him. I put my arms around him. I said, Nelson, I am so sorry. He said, for what? I said, I was a jerk in college. Nelson was my college roommate. I had not seen him in 40 years. He said, Sammy, we were 18 years old. I said, being 18 doesn't give you the right to be a jerk. Being 80 doesn't give you the right to be a jerk either. So I still lacked one. I couldn't find them. I was in a conference in Nashville, Tennessee at Lifeway. We were sitting around tables, and we were to go around the table and introduce ourselves. And a guy introduced himself and told me what city he was from. And I said, wow, I had a friend that used to live in that city and told him the name. And he looked, he said, they're in my church. I said, really? I said, would it be possible for you to give me their contact information? He said, sure, I've got it in my phone. And he sent me their contact information. I got home and... I sat down and wrote a long, long letter. I never will forget when I walked to the post office box and dropped it in the mailbox at the post office, I thought an apology, 40 years overdue. Folks, I'm telling you, if you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of a pure conscience. It may be that you owe your wife or your husband or your children, your grandchildren. Maybe you owe your grandparents, maybe someone you work with. But I'm telling you, until you can stand before God with a clear conscience, there are some real, real problems there. And if you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of a clear conscience. Look with me in about a part of verse 3. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience, that without ceasing... I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. If you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of remembering. Someone prayed for you. Someone shared Christ with you. Someone mentored you. Someone stood by you when you were in trouble and no one else even knew. I took another piece of paper and I started writing down the names that that I knew made a difference in my life. While I was praying about that, it was like God said, Sammy, if I took five people out of your life, you'd be a derelict today. That's a frightening thought. And I tried to think of who those people would be, and I wrote them down, and I found them and thanked them for the impact that had on my life. To be real honest with you, I sort of puffed up about it. I said, Lord, I did good. I I found all five of those and thanked them for the difference they made. And boy, he hit me right between the eyes. He said, Sammy, are you on anyone's list of five? If everyone in this church made a list of five people that made an eternal difference in their life, would you be on anyone's list? You mean to tell me that we're going to go through life and not made enough difference in anyone's life that would be on their list of five. If you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of remembering. Sometimes you get numb to situations you're in, and I guess we were sort of getting into the routine of living with this condition I have. I was sitting in my recliner in October of this last fall. 
My cell phone rang, and I glanced at it, and I didn't recognize the number. Normally, I do not answer it when I don't recognize the number. But I, I, I just felt like I needed an answer, and I said, Sammy Gilbert. They said, Mr. Gilbert, are you feeling okay? That's a strange thing to come across your phone. I said, well, I think so. They said, this is Vanderbilt Hospital. You're not okay. Because of the rarity of my situation, there's a monitor in the cardiac unit at Vanderbilt Hospital. And they said, it's not good. How quickly can you get here? We hurried to Vanderbilt and met with their surgeon's team and said, you realize this is risky, but we're out of options. They said, you can't live like this any longer. Your ejection fraction has now dropped below what your body can function. Your blood pressure is completely out of control. The heart rate's off the charts. Your EKG is scrambled. You can't live like this. He said, I'd like to try some things. And I said, go ahead. When I woke up, my surgeon was standing at the foot of my bed with Carol. and He said, Mr. Gilbert, he said, before we even closed your chest, your heart responded like I've never seen before. Your blood pressure's level. Your ejection fraction is up. Your heart beats good. He said, it's incredible. I am doing better today than I have done in 10 years. Another example of my Lord choosing to sustain me one day at a time. But folks, I'd be an idiot to overlook how precious life is. I know I don't have tomorrow promised. But I beg you tonight to realize you don't either. And so here's what I'm going to ask tonight. I want you to look right this way because you're going to, you're going to be tempted to look around. I want you to look right here and think with me. If the person sitting beside you or right in front of you or right behind you slips out into eternity tonight, what are you going to spend the rest of your life wishing that you had told them? In just a minute, I'm going to give you the privilege to go tell them. I hope, ladies, that you'll slide over to that old crusty guy and say thank you for being God's answer. That word, I'm sorry, may choke him right there a lot. But he loves you. And, sir, you need to put your arm around her and say thank you for hanging in there with me. You may need to find your grandkids or grown adult children. You may need to find a pastor or a staff member. You may need to find a deacon or someone who led you to the Lord. But in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and go find someone who made a difference in your life. Because if you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of remembering. Now remember the first point. If you're going to learn to live like you're dying, you learn the value of the promise of life. I don't care who you are tonight. I don't care what you've done, where you've been. My Lord stands ready to forgive and to save and to grant you eternal life. Would you please tonight put a value on life enough to give our Lord your life? He gave His life for you. Would you pray with me? Our pastor's going to be here. Steve's going to come and Maybe just some music playing. Steve, we won't even sing if you don't mind. Just some music. Pastor's going to be here. Our heads are bowed. Folks, I cannot emphasize more how I'd love to beg you to realize how important it is tonight that you learn to live like you're dying. Someone in this room stood by you and they think you've probably forgotten it would make their day. It might make their year if you just go to them and say, thank you for standing by me when no one else even knew I was in trouble. This is not a fellowship course where you shake hands. It's go find somebody, maybe the best friend you've got at school or whatever, and say, thank you 
for making an eternal difference in my life. Father, I, I thank you for another day. I thank you for Carol and Barrett and Brynn as they have stood by me. Thank you for sustaining me one day at a time. God, would you please take these verses, take the thought of learning to live like you're dying into somebody here tonight, cause them to come and invite you to be their Savior and Lord. Lord, somebody in this room needs to join this church. Someone needs to come for baptism. And everybody here, Father, needs to find somebody that's made a difference in their life. And so I'm asking that you allow the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. Give them the freedom to find somebody to say thank you. To remember the difference they made in their life. We'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory. With our heads bowed, would you stand with me please? No one looking around. I'm going to beg you tonight. I, I'm, I'm begging somebody to care enough about somebody to go to them and say thank you to your wife, to your husband, to your best friend, to your pastor, to your staff, to your next door neighbor, to the best friend at school. Already people are moving. That's right, just go find them. Go find somebody and say thank you for being the best friend I've ever had. Thank you for being my husband, my wife. Thank you for being my child, my parent, my grandparent. Somebody's waiting on you to come. But some of you need to come to this pastor and say, I need a church home. I need to move my membership. I need to come for baptism. I need to invite Jesus Christ into my life. Come on. In the balcony, if you need to come down front, please come on. We'll wait on you. Make your way down here to find someone. They're waiting on you to come. They're praying you haven't forgotten. Come on. You're going to get home and you're going to wonder why in the world didn't I go to them and you will have missed this opportunity. Go find them. Go find somebody and say, thank you for being the best friend I've ever had. Thank you for the difference you made in my life spiritually. Hurry. Someone's waiting on you to come. Go find that golfing buddy. Go find that fishing buddy. Go find that lady you have coffee with. They're waiting on you to come. Real revival begins when we love on one another. When we remember the difference they made in our life. It's okay to find that second or third person, but hurry. You're going to let time run out on you. On this last stanza, are you sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord? Do you need to come here and join this church? Place your membership here? Come for baptism? What a great time to do that. They're still waiting on you to come. They're waiting on you to come to them. Go bless their life. By telling them what they mean to you. One last time through. You're going to let it slip away. 
You're going to lose the opportunity unless you hurry. I wish you could stand where I'm standing and see what's going on all over the building. Real evidence of revival taking place as we love on one another, remember the difference they've made in our life. thankful to be your pastor and uh, folks God is good and uh, he he has blessed all of us I thank the Lord for my wife Donna who stood by me a long time Amen. you know sometimes we take it for granted what we have right here at our church and I, I'm just want to thank you for being a faithful church and for being faithful to the Lord and uh, I just believe God is going to do still a great work right here tonight and this week and in the future. And uh, thank you for being faithful to him. But the same, what a, what a wonderful, I've heard him share that a bunch of times. But tonight, I'm telling you, the Lord's anointing was on this man. Thank you so much. Tonight, after the service, he's going to be over here in our lobby. And uh, they have written a book about his life about living like you're dying and uh, those are going to be for you to purchase if you'd like to tonight I think he told me they were $15.99 plus tax which is $17.55 and uh, do him like you do the lady at the restaurant give him a $20 bill and say give me a book okay if you want one and he'll sign it for you and uh I've already got one. I heard him share this over at Mount Vernon last year. And uh, every now and then I pull out that book and look at it and, and read what God's done in this man's life. And uh, this week has been a good week so far for me. Uh, just been able to sit with Brother Steve and Brother Sammy and talk about ministry and talk about life. And uh, Don and I were talking about it last night. It's amazing. Some of the places Brother Sammy's been. I hadn't been many places since he's been. I don't want to go some of the places he's been. Um, but he's been some places sharing that are very similar to some of the places I've been. And it's renewed my memory about how good God is and how faithful God is. And, uh, you know, God didn't call me to be Sammy Gilbert. He called me to be me. And uh, I'm thankful that God called you to be you. And you have a particular place in this place, every one of you. And you can't all be what I am. I can't be what you are. But together, we can say glory to God and thank him. So thank you tonight. And uh, we're going to sing and close. And, and I, I've also been blessed by a dear friend of mine, Brother Billy Ted's here tonight, was here last night been very very sick and hadn't been able to be here Billy Ted it's so good to see you and have you in the service with us he and his dear wife and uh, this we're just blessed tonight isn't it good just to be in the Lord's presence and uh, not worry about the time just Lord you think we're thankful that you're here and uh, be able to go away and say it was good to be in the Lord's house Steve sing us out of here brother it's been a good day got banana pudding 
Brother Mike texted me this afternoon about 4 o'clock and said, No ties. Hallelujah. Let's sing this. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace. Have a blessed evening. See you tomorrow night.